You wake up from stasis on a ship coming apart. You hear the sound of explosions, see debris falling, parts of the ship collapsing. The noise is cut through by the voice of Dr. Janice Polito, we presume. Under her direction, and if we wish to progress, we cannot deviate from her commands, we bring order to the room we are in and proceed further into the ship. The violent sounds are gradually replaced by something quieter, calmer, and we soon encounter our first in-person human from behind an unbreakable window, fleeing from a monster. This body does not speak in the calm yet menacingly authoritarian affect of Polito, but expresses her being in the world without reservation, with terrified vocalizations. The monster chasing her is a hybrid, a creature formed from the counterpoint of human and annelid, crossing species, morphologies and voices, playing within the contradiction of individual and collective. I am filled with apprehension, not for the monster's actions, but for the crewmate's trailing screams, which are not my own, but which I have, like the hybridization of human and annelid, taken into my flesh and transformed. In this ostensibly horror game, what do we sense that causes us to fear? Even the game seems at times unsure. Do we need to be told that this is a disgusting pile of words? The cyborg assassins in particular are not so much scary as hilariously caricatured. By modern graphical standards, their low-res polygonal forms are a long way from the xenomorph horror of, say, the recent Dead Space remaster. But the first time I took damage, I did not see my attacker. I heard a groan, and only after half my health had disappeared did I turn and get a few blows in with my sturdy wrench, comforted by the audio feedback such an action provides, of the mechanical overcoming the biological. The wailing of cyborg midwives, the chittering of the arachnids, and the beeping of Xerxes security systems cameras threatening to expose my location followed me for the rest of the game. Kevin Veal writes of this phenomenon, that the game provides a detailed three-dimensional soundscape for the diegetic environment. The experience of the text is that every action is taken in the certain knowledge that you are being hunted. Immersion in System Shock 2 lies in the audio design, where the aesthetic distance of the tropey and now outdated visuals is overcome by intricately layered sound. In this is the potential to so fully inhabit the soundscape that my own sense of individual, sovereign subjectivity is dissolved. The spatiality of the environment is joined by the equally diegetic yet despatialized audio logs. The time is 16.30. Autopsy subject A. Watson. Now we're going to make the first incision in... Hold him down. I'm yes. trying to! Yes, I'm trying! <laughs> While a live feed from Polito gives us orders which, alongside the ambience of the ship, informs our immediate response to the game world, the context behind our actions and anything that might be termed story is provided by a series of pre-recorded messages left behind by the now absent crew. These audio logs reverse the agential relationship I have to the game's soundscape. In contrast with the continuous atmospheric sound which informs our actions, we can choose to play and replay the discrete audio logs by pressing a button or navigating the UI. However, while our actions have a causal impact on the game world, for example, avoiding setting off alarms, what the absent crew say, how the audio logs sound, is beyond our control. But like all the other sounds, they construct a possibility of unpredictable future sounds which might harm us. Perhaps these missing crew members heard the same sounds we do. In contrast to the sound design, the soundtrack of System Shock 2 fades into the background of our experience. The electronic beats serve well enough to ground us in the futuristic cyborg setting, but the soundtrack bears a striking independence to the log entries and the game's overall narrative. One might question whether, between the music and spoken word, if we would experience the narrative and sonic intricacies of the log entries any differently with or without the soundtrack, or even with the ever-present threat of shuffling, grunting hybrids and sinister electronic beeping if the soundtrack even adds to the affective atmosphere. Nevertheless, despite what I identify as a lacklustre soundtrack, System Shock 2 is filled with incredibly profound music. Of the shuffling hybrids, many barks, four stand out. The many sings to us. We hear flesh. Silence the discord. Your song is not ours. 
Music, sound and voices are a more than metaphorical relationship between our non-diegetic selves as players and avatars and the diegetic life world and game world we inhabit. The simultaneity of music and organic bodies is well worn in speculative fiction. In gaming, Mass Effect's insectoid hive mind rachni stand out in this regard, and what is Mass Effect if not System Shock with a dialogue wheel and sexy aliens? In what feels like a direct parallel to System Shock, Commander Shepard fights through a research lab of alien bugs, navigating past the now indoctrinated scientists until they find the Rachni Queen, who begs Shepard to save her. What were thought to be an inherently violent species are revealed, in the moment of voiced conversation, to have been a peaceful, culturally advanced communal species. It is where their hive community is forced apart, forcibly bred for war by machines, that their song becomes soured by a discordant note. We can easily and immediately relate to the Asari because of their visual presentation, but overcoming what Bioware clearly intended to be an instinctively repulsive non-humanoid image is helped through coherent voicing and conversation. But in giving the Rachni a voice, it begs the question of how or whether we could relate to them if we were not offered an explicit voiced dialogue option to show compassion. System Shock 2's greatest strength is making engagement with non-human life primary, forcing contact whether we like it or not. Human voices only briefly interject System Shock 2's background other than humanness. The familiar cyberpunk theme of the invasion of the human body, where the skin which bounds this body is breached by aliens and cybernetics, also allows an invasion of the alien and cybernetic world by the human body. One cannot think of a harmony defining a note except as that note expands outward to resonate with that harmony. For all the extreme range of audio information that the game provides us, it is all the more striking that the protagonist remains mute, and our sonic agency in the game world amounts to silencing the atmosphere. It is an intensely disturbing reversal, but it is a doubling of the emphasis on the non-human priority. Commander Shepard can speak because they are a human in the human-centric game, yet the narrative of diverse species coming together in fact reinforces a divisive cultural dynamic, making the cultural logic of neoliberal multiculturalism more tangible by enabling players to test the validity of their propositions within its regime of truth. What we understand as agency, decision-making, and expression is subordinated to particular interspecies determinisms which designate good species against bad. The unnamed soldier in System Shock is the human exception, the monospecies disruption to the child species world. As the alien and cybernetic world breaches our skin, we reach out into the game with silence. Our tools are not a wrench, a gun, a psionic burst, but our own projecting the sound of our life world into the game world, to ultimately finish the game and return to our non-diegetic soundscape. But it would not be correct here to conclude that System Shock is the speciesist counterpart to Mass Effect's alien loving. What is truly at stake here is the agency of the sovereign individual, the player or the avatar, in navigating these dynamics. Past the veil of superficial decision-making, we find the individual is deleteriously harmful to the truly revolutionary communal, whether or not this decision can be made. Ultimately, these fears and inhibitions are manifested in a disembodied soundscape, where our own player body is set apart from our virtual action through expressive impossibilities. What is our reaction when these voices are linked with on-screen beings of whatever species, when our perceiving bodies are shown to always already be whole? and in this way part of a communal world. Surely this would then be an exercise in ecstasy. Our first encounter with the gestalt flesh of the antagonistic the many, and our first clue to its nature as a single organism occurs partway through the second level, where our wandering in the engineering deck is interrupted by a vision of the inside of the many's biomass. Do you not trust the feelings of the flesh? We welcome you to our minds. How can you choose cold metal over the splendor of flesh? We offer another chance to join us. We are explicitly offered a choice, and I choose joy. This cutscene is inviting us as players to find not so much pleasure, but the extremity of being by sinking fully into direct experience. But we cannot push a button to do so. In a world where meaning, identity and narrative are forged through speech, to offer a silent protagonist a choice seems almost cruel. 
To the extent that I inhabit the game's sound atmosphere, I find myself alienated from it. It is here that we find the true horror of the game. Not that we cannot make a choice as an individual who impacts the game in a fundamental way, but that we cannot give this up. That we cannot be outside of a system where making or not making a choice is sensible. We might find this kind of joy in inhabiting the soundscape I have already outlined. Perhaps joy is a somewhat strange word to use, but whatever affect we feel listening to the threatening atmosphere of the Von Braun is certainly intense. At the point where we inhabit our direct sensory perception of the medium, we find ourselves in a limit experience. This limit experience is the dissolution of the sovereign individual, tearing the subject from itself. Where the subject reaches decomposition, and there's certainly something musical to be said about decomposition, where the subject reaches decomposition, leaves itself at the limits of its own impossibility. This is precisely what it is to join the many. Yet the game rails against these experiences. We only have the option to bring silence to the game world or die and be booted back to the main menu. In the words of the many, If you choose to lie down with the machine, we will rend you apart and put you separate from the joy of the man. We struggle to reach this limit experience because the mechanics of the game only allow us to act fight or die as an individual. Ironically, it is where we have no choice but to perform certain actions, where we are the avatars of the musical architecture of the game, following the will of disembodied voices that we touch on the joy of the many. Yet the neoliberal conceit of choice continues to haunt us. Why can I not leave the spectre of choice behind and simply be in the game? Perhaps I am exposing my own xenophilic proclivities and expressing a desire to be part of the many, but it reflects the reactions of many of the crew members who do join. With a singular, individual voice, they express a fear of becoming a fully embodied syncretic being. Yet, almost universally, the sense of trepidation of joining is contradicted once they speak with the many's voice, join the chorus of sensation. An audio log from William Diego found on the hydroponics deck is particularly evocative. I believe the plans the many have for me are greater than I even imagined. The change is upon me and that the path is more glorious than we imagined. It does not stop at a mere single mutation. The form I have been promised is more beautiful than any of that. They tell me I will float through the air and strike at the foes of our biomass with my mind. With our mind. My cup runneth over. Towards the end of the game, we find that Diego's ecstasy is replaced by remorse as he surgically excises his annelid symbiote, but it should be noted that he does so under a singular human voice. He is the shadow of what our protagonist could be if he were able to speak. When we die, we return to the main screen instead of becoming part of the many, only because the choice to be a sovereign individual is affirmed if our experience stops just short of the limit. Diego removing his symbiote is not a triumphal reclamation of humanity, but a performative utterance of an individualist, even speciesist paradigm through speech. Upon reaching the operations deck, we find the corpse of Dr. Polito, and the malevolent computer program showdown drops her facade. Polito's human voice is replaced by the emotionless affect of a machine. The Polito form is dead, insect. Are you afraid? What is it you fear? The end of your trivial existence. When, when, when the history of my glory is written, your species shall only be a footnote to my magnificence. Her once singular speech is a counterpoint of asynchronous voices, superficially like the many's. With the fleshy many, we hear the coming together of what were individuals into a whole, replete with all the vitality of the organic. Or perhaps even a sound world where these individuals had no meaning to begin with. The machine Shodan, who is understood to be singular from the start, with no desire to dissolve her subject even as she seeks to extend her perfect, sovereign influence, is heard as perpetual glitching. She refuses to participate in the mutability of the world, and as such her megalomaniacal desire for autonomy and control cannot be expressed harmoniously. While Polito was stern, Shodan varies between berating and lauding the player character. 
we are at once an insect and her valuable avatar in the world. And this contradiction is true of the game itself, which he hopes to control, where the linear determinate narrative is glitched by a matrix of chaotic invading sounds and desires. Perhaps Shodan is all too like the player character, or the player themselves, a clear dichotomy of success and failure, a certain silencing of the organics on board the ship, where the soundscape is fully knowable. The final level takes place in a relatively calm cyberspace of Shodan's design, finally liberated from the threatening potentiality of the mini soundscape. Her image, a feminine face surrounded by a wreath of writhing connective wiring, is evocative of the Medusa. As the unknowable machine mother Gorgon, her morphology, narrative, and importantly, voice plays on the trope of the monstrous feminine. However, just as Shodan's seemingly split voice is in truth the epitome of the individual, she is anything but the Medusa. This title better belongs to the many. The Medusa is loving across species and gender, the disruption of the enforced human slash non-human dichotomy which drives the horror of system shock. The wires which extend from Shodan's head to connect with the world are to make this world like her species. The song of the many is when speech is the trans species interconnectedness itself. The many's brain, or rather one of its many ganglia, is more like the bell of a jellyfish, a medusoid, rather than a human cortex. And while Shodan speaks to us from outside our body, the many speak psionically from within our own mind. This jellyfish's sting, the medusa's petrifying gaze, is traditionally the invasion of the autonomous body by something other than human debasing the self. Where the exteriority or interiority of the many's voice is a nonsensical dichotomy to begin with. In our climactic battle against Shodan, we use the technology she implanted in us to take down her shield, and her connective wreath is destroyed, revealing her true self, a lone face, a lone voice doomed to be an individual. I have been repeatedly referring to the protagonist as silent, but this is not quite true. He reacts somewhat to being attacked with a masculine grunt, perhaps an instinctive refusal of the encroaching feminine flesh of the many. But this is the limit of his vocality in the game proper. Fast forward to the final cutscene. Having just defeated Shodan, the machine mind offers to cybernetically improve the protagonist, to which he utters his first and only word. Nah. The totality of the protagonist's voice is refusal. Even before Bioshock's Would You Kindly Reveal, we might accept Jack's inability to disobey Atlas slash Fontaine's command because there is no instance of him vocally agreeing or disagreeing with anything. Harvesting the Little Sisters or not is not a choice because both are possible only within the paradigm of your brainwashing. Now, retroactively, we understand that System Shock 2's protagonist has agency over his actions to reject the many's flesh, and agency to deny us choice. I suggest that perhaps the soldier's now is primarily directed towards the player as we sit there, clicking a mouse without speaking and singing. We are a kind of extra universe showdown. We have been upgrading his cybernetic implants on Shodan's behalf as we progress, and in refusing her, the soldier is ultimately refusing the level-up screen that we use to invade his flesh. It is our own lack of speech that has silenced the protagonist, who finally escapes the neoliberal world of faux choice by refusing the possibility of this choice. We realise with abject terror that our silent obedience to defeating enemies and avoiding death precludes our union with the biomass. It is not so much that our player agency is limited or fictive. To frame agency as such is to speak with Shodan's voice, commanding the player character, our own insect, to utilise or torture at a whim. I do not wish to play hours of a game, committing acts of violence against my own desires to finally speak them. As an alternate play style, I suggest this. We awaken from stasis on a ship coming apart. Our only company is a disembodied voice, so we continue in search of fleshy company. We see a crewmate running from a hybrid xenomorph, and we scream with her, grumble with them. The first time we take damage, we do not see our attacker. We hear a groan, but we turn to face them, see that they are smiling and laugh with them. And when Shodan tells us to defend ourselves, to raise our silencing weapon with individualistic intent, we simply say, Nah. <laughs> 